Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery. And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. coming to you live uh, and I'm not sure that I want to uh, be coming on live because uh, we've had our first uh, boy I don't even know what to call it um, I'll, I'll show you my well I think I did I showed you my setup the other day and um, I've got a, a secondary monitor now to where I can just look like this and I can see uh, who all is joining in uh, to the live call-in link. And um, so I, I posted the link, and I'm, this, was, this was fast. Somebody, somebody was looking for this. Um, I posted the live link to the Zoom meeting where uh, you can call in and you can uh, give me questions, comments. Uh, may maybe you disagree with me about something and, and you'd just like to bring it up and find out where my brain is and maybe I'll find out where your brain is and maybe your brain is in a better place than mine. But um, as, as soon as I posted the link I put it on Twitter, X, and then I put it on Facebook, um, and then I posted that to our Bethel Watchman uh, official group on Facebook, and within, within about a minute, uh, I hear this noise and I look over at the monitor, somebody has logged in with about four different accounts. And in all four of them, they were um, playing filthy stuff. Um, wicked Sodom stuff and it it took me uh, a few minutes to get them all off of there I don't know if anybody else uh, logged in there during that time and I don't know if maybe someone um, that logged in I don't know if you can see who all else is logged in. I don't know that. Uh, if that's the case, then um, I'm going to have to learn more. I'm either going to have to learn more about Zoom uh, to, to know how to um, block that stuff even before it comes up or as it comes up or whatever uh, because I, that's just, that is unacceptable. And to whoever the vile, disgusting, um, demented, pervert that number one This person knows 
where to go and get that kind of garbage. That person's got a tremendous, serious problem. Um, then for that same person to post that on a place where there is a possibility that children could be um, watching or listening. I mean, I, the audio, I don't think, went out over my live feed here. Um, but if, if it's true that if, if somebody else logged in and um, then they're able to see what this pervert posted, um, if, if you did that in front of kids, you belong in prison is, is where you should go. You should go to prison. And um, I'm just, you know, no matter what good you try to do, there's always some raving lunatic that wants to ruin it for you and for everybody else. And I don't care. I don't care if this, I don't care if this pervert's listening. Um, you are a pervert. You are demonically possessed. And unless you yield your life, your heart, your mind, and your body over to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will suffer the wrath and the vengeance of an all-powerful, almighty God. And um, now, if I can't, if I can't prevent, uh, I think I've got it set up. As far as my Zoom meeting goes, uh, and by the way, if you if you have not logged in, please do so. Please do so. I, I would like to hear uh, from some of, 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 of you out there. Uh, it's the reason why I set all this up. When I first announced that, you know, I was thinking about doing a, a live uh, call-in show. Everybody's, everybody's going, wee, yay, way, this is going to be great. And uh, nobody's there. So, um, you know, if, if you're out there and you'd like to be a part of this, come on. Let's go. Ah, I see one. And um, all right. Nope. They left. They left. Uh, we'll 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 keep an eye on it. Uh, anyway, uh, good to be with you today. We finally, oh my goodness, uh, we have gotten rain for the first time uh, since the hurricane um, that devastated uh, Pennsylvania and um, East Tennessee and North Carolina and those areas. Uh, we got some good rain last night, but boy, it's taking its toll on me. I can tell you that. So um, I am just, yeah, I'm, I'm needing my hot tub today is what I need. Uh, but anyway, it's good to be with you today. And uh, we are winding down uh, quickly to the 2024 election. And uh, I'm not going to say a, a very much about that today, other than I've already voted. My wife has already voted. Most of the people in our church have already voted. And um, if if you if you if you honestly think that I voted for Kamala Harris, yeah. 
Um, no way, no how. If I didn't make it clear enough Sunday morning where I stood, and I will say this, where this church stands, we are united, and I love this, because in this same church, I would say going back about 18 years ago, um, we had a deacon and his wife that were uh, Union Democrats. St. Louis is a big Union stronghold. And here's what's funny about it. Um, this, this Union guy who was a deacon in our church, uh, he worked at Chrysler. There used to be a, uh, all of the minivans that Chrysler made back in the 80s, 90s, and so on, they made there in Fenton, Missouri, which is just not too far from here. And they were so successful uh, at making them there that they moved the entire uh, uh, manufacturing place to Mexico. And that is because the, the auto workers unions kept demanding more and more and more and more. So all of these businesses got together and they got with leaders in Congress whom they paid off and Bill Clinton was part of this as well. All you union guys out there that said, well, Clinton's for the working man. Clinton was the one pushing NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, which means that all of the manufacturing jobs went down to Mexico they work down there for pennies on the dollar. They manufacture things that we used to manufacture in this country, and then they ship them back across the border, no tariff whatsoever. And they said, that helps, that helps everybody. Uh, but anyway, he, if, if I would have preached that sermon, if he would have been here as a member, he would have quit by now. I mean, I'm, I'm quite certain that he probably would have made up his mind, I ain't going back to that church ever again. And that's just how he was. And so, but anyway, I, I have right now probably one of the most unified bodies of believers that I think I've ever had in a long time here. And that's saying a lot because I've been here a long time. And I am enjoying it. I am. I enjoy the people of Bethel Church, uh, these are some of the greatest people that I know. Uh, God is doing a good work uh, in this church and with this church. And, with, and, and I'll, I'll extend the, what I believe about its people all the way to all y'all out there all over the country, all over the world, in Kenya, and all the places uh, I am, we're just enjoying the blessings that God has given us here. And I just, I want to say thank you to everybody uh, for being a part of uh, this wonderful, wonderful uh, work that God is doing that we call Bethel Church. And um, uh, to all of you out there, God bless you. I love you. I love you to pieces. Um, I want to, um, let, let's, let's do this today. It is October 31st. Today is the day that somebody, well, I won't say, I won't just say somebody. Today is the day that people all over the world are going to be ritualistically sacrificed. Human sacrifice still exists. Now, nobody wants to talk about that, but that is true. We had a man uh, from India uh, a couple of years ago, a, a brother by the name of Sam Kotavatikani was his name. And uh, he, was, uh, he was in town. Um, I think he is um, 
working with um, uh, Brother Ron Dagonia and um, uh, another pastor down south from us. And uh, he comes to America uh, every now and then and tries to raise support for his uh, ministry there in India. And I'm, I listen, I'll tell you something. India is a place that needs the gospel. They need it bad. Um, there are parts of India that are just, they're filthy places, dirty places. And it's because of their religious ideas. You know, when you are walking down the street and all of a sudden there's an ox standing there on the sidewalk or in the middle of the road chewing cud and then dumping waste all over the place uh, and nobody cleans it up. And it's because their religious idea has told them that that is somebody that used to be a human, but because of karma, they have to uh, live a life now that is a beast. And nobody dares kill that animal because that could be your grandfather or your great uncle or whatever. And he was, he lived a, a, a very poor, uh, immoral life. And so he is reincarnated, reincarnated into the shape of a beast. And only uh, his next life does he have any chance of having a better life than what he's got now. And that, it's, that still exists out there. And you have people out there that are what are called the untouchables. Now, Brother Sam told us this. He said there are temples in India where if, let's say you're, a, you're somebody, you're very wealthy, and you're wealthy because you're a gangster. You are the head of an organized crime syndicate in India, and you make billions of rupees uh, every year. I don't know how much a rupee is, but anyway... You make the rupees. Now, your belief system says that all 330 million gods may not be all that happy with you. So we got to get the gods happy. We got to make them happy. And the only way to make these gods happy is with a human sacrifice. That's the only way. So, um, you, don't, you don't look within your, your household to find a suitable sacrifice. You send some of your henchmen out to the areas where these untouchables live. These are people that are on the lowest possible uh, caste that can that can exist in India. They have they still have the caste system, and they have degrees of humans, which is abhorrent in God's eyes. There is no such thing as a human of a lower degree, or one that is of a higher degree and the two can't have anything to do with each other so you go out you send your guys out to find some kid nine ten years old you steal him from his parents you take him to this temple you pay some money to the uh, temple priests and they will perform a human sacrifice on this child for your benefit. Now, you would expect that 
a third world country where people, um, they live under that kind of superstition. You would, you would expect to believe that that's how it goes in a nation like India. Okay? But the truth is, um, that person being sacrificed and the rich person having them sacrificed says, I gave my sacrifice, blood was shed, therefore the gods are going to forgive me of my sins and they're going to give me a better life to live. That same concept is why most Americans who participate in the abortion industry in America, well, that's the biggest reason why they get an abortion to begin with. They say, well, you know, my daughter was supposed to get a, uh, a scholarship to uh, Harvard University. And she just won't have time to take care of a baby and go to Harvard at the same time and get and take advantage of this of this scholarship that she has. And she made a mistake. I mean, it was obviously a mistake. And you know, there's no there's no sense in making her deal with this mistake, you know, for the rest of her life. So we'll kill the baby. That's, that's how it is. A baby becomes an inconvenience. A baby is the result of the sinful, promiscuous lifestyle that young people live in in this country. And because of that, rather than the, the, the girl or the boy, uh, rather than them uh, paying for their own sinfulness, they just sacrifice the child. And now the young man and the young lady, well, they're free to live their life now however they want to live. Because they're going to be doctors and they're going to be, you know, lawyers and they're going to be very important people in this world is what they're going to be. And, and so we just can't have a, we just can't have an unplanned pregnancy getting in the way of that. And that's generally, that's generally how that works. You know, I think I've got a setting here. Um, on my Zoom thing that automatically disallows anybody from uh, posting any video or any audio. And I keep seeing somebody try to log in with different names and then when they realize they can't display their perverted video, they just, they, they hang up. They, they jump back off okay all right um, let's talk about uh, witches for a minute well for a little while um, yeah let's let's uh, Galatians 5 uh, for those of you who might think that uh, well I've got it case sensitive no wonder I didn't have very many verses uh, there would be some people who would say, well, you know, the witchcraft thing, um, you know, that's all Old Testament stuff and, and God doesn't have a problem with it in the New Testament. In fact, there are good witches and they practice white magic and not black magic. And so, uh, therefore, they're good. Okay. Excuse me. There is no such thing. When God 
gave us the works of the flesh, they're manifested. In other words, they always show up. And there's a list, and, and I like this. I like, I like how the Bible gives you these two opposites here. On one hand, you're given 18 works of the flesh. But right after that, you're given nine fruits of the Spirit. Both of those numbers are divisible by nine. And so the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. All four of those have everything to do with the way people think, the way people act. Um, these works of the flesh are manifested, especially in today's world, because of this. No, not that, not a leather billfold. Um, because of the phone. They can get some kind of app on their phone and within minutes can find a partner, male or female. They can hook up with that person. They don't even have to have their real names if they don't want to. And I know somebody who does this habitually. It is something that they do quite often. No, they don't go to church here. But I know this person. And whenever they get in the mood, they just pull the phone up, go to the app, boom. Find somebody that lives maybe within 20 miles drive to their house or have them drive to their house or maybe they'll meet somewhere at a sleazy, uh, you know, these a lot of these hotels that were built in the 90s right alongside interstate highways. Most of these things have become, you know, uh, crack houses, drug hotels where everything that goes on goes on in these hotels. And uh, but these four things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. They have to do with how we think in our minds, what we're thinking of in our minds, and how we can act those things out. Lasciviousness, uh, uncleanness, those things, they start in the heart of man. If it's in, you know, it's one thing, and I'll say this to everybody, it's one thing if the devil gets you to thinking unclean thoughts. That happens daily with some people. It's part of, part of life. The problem is when we transfer those thoughts from our brain to our heart, because once they're in the heart, that's when we start justifying it. That's when we start looking for ways to act those thoughts out. As long as they're in the brain, we can, the Bible talks about casting down imaginations. And every high thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So it could be in our brain, we can cast it down, we can pray, uh, we can uh, fill our mind with scriptures, we can get busy doing something, go outside and dig a ditch, okay? That, that'd be good for you. But when people have too much time on their hands, too much idleness, what happens? It goes from their brain to their heart, then their heart starts devising the way that they can they can uh, act out the things that are in their mind and in their heart. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, and witchcraft. See, it doesn't matter if it's ancient witchcraft, modern witchcraft, doesn't matter. 
it is witchcraft. And I, I've said this before and I'll continue to say it. There are two, two religions in this world, Bible Christianity and witchcraft. And I, I, would, I would almost dare you, and, and I don't really think you should do this, but I would almost dare you to um, maybe do some research into some some modern church. When I say modern church, I'm, I mean the churches that have adopted all of the all of the things that Rick Warren talked about. Uh, you know, they they got rid of the pews, and they got put in chairs, and they got uh, they took out all the lights in the sanctuary. Now it's dark. And the only lights on is on the stage, and the preacher doesn't wear. He doesn't dress up anymore. In some cases, in the summertime, the preacher comes out wearing shorts, like he's going to go play basketball or something like that. Uh, preachers, preachers getting tattoo sleeves up both arms, tattoos all over their body, and they come out and they display those tattoos. Did you not know that God said, don't do that? Don't print marks on your skin. God said so. So anyway, these modern churches and they, you know, everybody's got their coffee and, and, no, and no, no set version of the Bible because he's going to go through four or five different translations, going to put a bump on the screen. So why in the world should you carry a Bible to church? And the people are more interested in hearing what that preacher has to say than they are the Word of God. That's, that's your typical modern church that's out there. And um, I, what I was going to say is, I almost guarantee you, if you know what to look for, you're going to discover that this church, very subtly, is teaching a, a works-based blessing from God or a works-based salvation. Maybe it comes in the form where they're going to do a teaching on what real worship is. And they're going to tell you that if you, if you worship in a certain way, then God then will respond to that and he will come and he will give you blessings. You will be in the flow of God and God will just pour out great blessings to you. But if you're not worshiping in the right way, doing the right thing, saying the right words, closing your eyes, squinting real hard to make it look like you're really in intense agony like that. I really want God to bless me like that. Um, and you see these people doing that uh, because they're told that they have to have not just a normal faith, but a super faith. They can't just sing along with the songs. They have to do intense worship to get in the flow of God where his blessings are. If you understand what those are, those are all works that that man tells you you have to do in order to receive any blessings from God. It's works-based grace or it's works-based salvation. And some of them make it easy for you to spot it. And um, I'll, let me just say this out there. If any of you out there uh, know of a church, one of these modern churches, and you suspect that they are teaching a gospel that involves works like what I just described for you or anything else, um, send me a note at uh, pastormikeonline at gmail.com and uh, I'd love to read um, what you've come up with uh, on, a, on a future broadcast, uh, which reminds me, hang on a second. I asked, I got a phone call the other day, speaking, speaking of witches, I got a phone call the other day, 
and uh, this guy was telling me his um, his testimony uh, of an event that took place, and uh, I asked him to write that down and send it to me, and I'd read it. Uh, this is from a guy named Mike, and he said, uh, me and my ex-wife lived in uh, Sunman, India, Indiana, and we, we saw a silhouette of a man uh, in the corner one night of the old house that we lived in, uh, and then a few nights later, we were pray, playing Scramble. There's nothing wrong with playing Scramble, by the way. Um, and then when we went to bed, I was on the right side of the bed. She was on the left side. She had her head on my left arm laying on my left shoulder, and I had a dream that there was this woman and what appeared to be a black and white pilgrim-type outfit, that's how she was dressed, with a pilgrim-type hat, uh, and she was standing at the right side of, of our bed, looking down at me with her hands in front of her, making circular motions as one hand went inside uh, the uh, the other hand went outside, alternating. That's kind of hard to do. Like that, maybe like that. I don't know. Atten uh, in uh, circular patterns. When I woke up, I looked over at my wife, and she was looking at something. Her eyes were looking at. Um, the same spot that I dreamed the woman in my dream was standing and she was like paralyzed and couldn't move, couldn't speak. Uh, and uh, my arm was choking her. It was locked around her throat so that I, I had to let go and I got out of the bed and, and backed uh, backwards to that when you back, you usually go backwards anyway um let's see here to the to the light and switch the light on and as soon as the light came on she kind of came out of it but was scared to death and struggled to talk and so i demanded to know what she was looking at i asked her four or five times and uh finally uh, she explained that she had seen the exact same thing that I saw in my dream. Only she saw it awake. She was fully awake, and she saw the same thing this guy saw in his dream. Um, she, he said, I've not told very many people this. I get cold chills every time I, I think about it. I don't really like talking about it. I would just soon forget it. A few days later, uh, I'm at a restaurant called the Old Brick Tavern where a lot of old people would gather in the mornings and, and I would go up uh, uh, in, the, in the morning at the restaurant and, and uh, drink coffee and listen to what uh, all these old men had to say to each other. I would never really speak. I would just listen. Uh, but I ended up asking them if they knew anything about the house that I lived in. It was a lime green house, uh, the only one in town. Uh, I told them some weird things have happened since I've been living there. And they said there was a story a long time ago about a witch who lived in that house and that they took her out and burnt her. Well, that's kind of rude. Um, they took her out and burned her, and they said that um, that was the rumor. Let's see here. And that was a long time ago. The kids also claimed to have seen a few things, like a, a, the image of a little boy in the basement. After they told me that, uh, a witch had lived there. I looked up 
uh, a lot of the words on the Scrabble board, and almost all of them had something to do with witches and witchcraft. And a lot of the words, I had no clue that they were used for such a thing as they were mostly normal words. But right after the dream that I had, I went through the house yelling at the top of my lungs, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And he said, once I did that, I never saw anything after that. 100% true story. And um, by the way, I just want you to know that I'm very, very grateful for the role that you have played in my life with all of your videos and all the information that you work so hard to let the world know. I've used lots of your videos, especially the DNA, Jesus Christ, Holy Bible, to try to reach people. Uh, with things about the Bible. Thank you for all that you do. I, and I'll say this, that the DNA video, uh, thank you, Mike, for sending that in. And uh, anybody else that's ever got a, a story like that, send it in to Pastor Michael online at Gmail, and uh, I'd love to read it online. Uh, these things are real. The Bible tells us these things are real. And... People will see ghostly apparitions, whether they are in a dream state or whether they are fully conscious and wide-eyed, they will see things. Familiar spirits dressed up as various people that might have an association with that house and days gone by. That's the nature of a familiar spirit is that it takes on the uh, sort of persona of somebody that at one time was actually living, and thereby they deceive people. Whenever I watch uh, some of these video channels like Slapped Ham and others, and they report about some poltergeist activity in a house, and then they kind of do a little backstory and say that years ago uh, in this same house, uh, there lived a famous witch that, uh, you know, when they talk about that, and the witch was, of course, killed in this house, and uh, so on and so on. And then they want you to think that this is the, um, the, the spirit of somebody that lived in that house and died a natural death or was killed or whatever. But folks, and, and, and think about how the devil would use that now. To convince people that if they die, there is a chance that they will roam the earth and they will be a, like a restless spirit on the earth. Anything except the truth that these people are dying and going to hell. They can't tell that part of the story. Only Paul Harvey can do that. I didn't hear. I didn't hear my sound effects. Were they even on? Yeah, they're they're on. Anyway, um, so witchcraft is part of it. In Galatians three, let me go back here. Uh, this is where I, this is the basis of where I get this idea that there are only two religions in the world. Bible Christianity, which the blessings that we get from God are always without merit. They are all unearned. With all the sermons that I teach and preach every week, the amount of work that I put into researching those sermons, researching those teachings, presenting them to you with, you know, with authority and also with a little bit of humor, all of those good deeds that I'm doing. 
feeding, feeding some four or five thousand people a month, every month out in Kenya. Not one of those things that I do buys me any grace merits with God. None of them. Let's say that at the end of this of this broadcast, 400 people get saved. Nothing that I've done merits that kind of response. I wouldn't be able to take credit for it because I know that I'm not worthy of it. And so whenever someone begins to boast about what they have, what they got from the Lord, um, like Joyce Meyer saying to our, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, um, that's a uh, local newspaper, it's a Democrat-run newspaper, and they ran a series of articles about her that didn't make her look all that good. So she, her publicist got with somebody at the local NBC affiliate, News Channel 5, and they did a, a few stories on her that made her look better. It was, it was PR time, public relations. She made the statement on on this broadcast, this news broadcast, where she said, I am rich because I deserve to be rich. The Bible says, give and it shall be given. And she went from there and talked about all the things that she does. She's got a home in central Missouri at Lake of the Ozarks. And she says that's where she goes to ghostwrite her books. Okay. Where's my, where's my sound effects? I need sound effects. I don't know. Maybe I muted everything. That's what happened. That's what happened. Now we'll try this again. Ah, there we go. Uh. But anyway, she says she deserves to be rich because she does all of these things right with God. And she works and she earns and she does great things. And so God naturally has to reward her for that. And here I am. I deserve nothing. But God is blessed. So when Paul said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now he's going to get into it. What did he mean by bewitching you? This only what I learn of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. I heard, I received it by faith. I heard the word of God. I surrendered to the word of God. God then blessed me with that Holy Spirit of promise. And as long as I continue in that belief, in that faith, then God then accounts that puts it on my ledger as righteousness and it blots out and covers all of the horrible bad things that I did and to you Mike and and your wife your ex-wife and this story about you seeing a witch and think I'll tell you this when you were explaining how she was doing things with her hands, you don't want to know what I thought of? Um, the story of, um, of uh, Jack Webb 
the, who was, when he was five, he saw a saucer come up to his back porch and a door open and this beautiful white woman with beautiful blonde hair, beautiful eyes that just seemed to catch your attention um, and all those children there surrounding her that were all like z zombie looking kids. Um, you know, when, when, when he saw that, that was, that was the same spirit of, of witchcraft. It is all, all of that comes from mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations, the earth. In fact, there is even, where is it? Ah, Nahum, chapter 3. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. You know, if you want to, I'm going to just temporarily change topics here. If you want to get an understanding of this uh, Sean Diddy Diddlin Combs story and understand what it's about, study this word W H O R E asterisk. You're going to get all 76 places in the Bible where the word whore, whores, whoredom, whoredoms is mentioned in the King James. You're going to get every one of those. And um, to, to, and I'm, I'm probably this weekend, that's what I'm going to be studying. As I, I thought about that because in my YouTube feed, almost every day, there is uh, some new story out there about, about Combs and about all the things that he did with, with the people that were below the age of 18 years old and the things that were done there and so on. And that word keeps coming up, whoredoms, whoremongers. I'm going to see if that's in the list here. Where, where, how would you spell whoremonger? Is it whoremonger like that? No. Yeah, yeah. It would be like, yeah, just so just W-H-O-R-E asterisk. And that will give you whore, whoredoms, whoremongers, the whole nine yards. And what I suspect you're going to get when you study something like this, you're going to get um, a better comprehension of the spirit that is present at these, what they call the white parties that, uh, that Diddy Combs had. And I've I made this statement the other day, and I'm gonna I'm gonna double down on it today. There is absolutely no doubt that some of the whoremongering that would go on at these parties, and I would say this is probably not limited to Diddy Combs. It probably. Um, probably is being done to either a greater or lesser degree with some other Hollywood people or uh, uh, people in the music industry, pop music, rap, hip-hop, rock and roll, you name it. The, the parties that they have and the rituals that they have and so on, I guarantee you, there is open and blatant devil worship 
taking place there. Do you remember several years ago the stories that were coming out that, that had to do with what they called Pizza Gate? You remember that? And there was this suspicion, and I won't get into all that. I don't know if any of that was true or not. I wasn't there, obviously, so I couldn't tell you if it was true or not. Uh, but they were having these weird parties, and there was this woman. She specialized in, I mean, what she called art. I just called debauchery is all it was. Uh, I'm trying to remember her name. I, I can see her. I can almost remember the name, but I can't quite bring it to mind. Um, but she was, she was being invited to these parties, and as part of her quote-unquote artwork, she would have a, a woman laying down in this long coffin thing surrounded by, like, grapes and strawberries and different types of fruits all around her in this coffin. And, of course, the part participants would come by with a plate and they would dip up some of that fruit off of that woman's body. And they called that art. It's just plain old debauchery is what it is. But I would say that things like that go back to the God of wine and revelry. And that God's name, he went by two different names. Bacchus was one of them. Dionysus was the other. One of them Roman, one of them Greek. But it was the same goddess. She was the goddess of wine, therefore she was the goddess of getting drunk. Well, what does that sound like? That is exactly who Babylon is. She's the goddess that can get everybody drunk and under a drunken spirit. That's who that is. So all of this stuff that goes on with Diddy Combs and everybody that's involved in that. And, you know, bless God that there was some Hollywood celebrities that had some kind of conscience. Denzel Washington gets invited to one. He's there for, well, I don't know what, three and a half minutes? <laughs> a little bit longer than that. But once he sees what's going on, he's like, I'm out of here. I am gone. This, this is not the party that I go to. And I think probably Denzel knew that there had to be cameras everywhere. And there were. And so you have all these rich, powerful people who are going in for these parties knowing that there is a a greater than 100% chance that they're going to be able to commit whoredoms with just about anybody there, man or woman. And so, um, going back to, uh, let me find this again. What was it? Nahum? Isaiah? Nahum, yeah. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, which is Babylon, um, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Notice that she selleth the nations through her whoredoms. One of the things that's said about Mystery Babylon in Revelation 18 is that the merchandise that is sold with her blessings on it is slaves, human slaves, and the souls of men. 
Now you think about that in relation to um, what the Bible tells us about Jezebel, the real Jezebel. That she had Naboth's vineyard, and we've all looked at what that vineyard represents, so we know what it is. But anyway, how she basically was going to get custody of this vineyard for her husband, the king. You can picture him as the Antichrist, or you can picture him as, uh, you know, the devil himself or whatever. Um, but she is going to get that vineyard so that uh, the so that uh, Naboth can't have it anymore. She has bought out Naboth's future. Uh, anything his kids would have inherited is gone. What did I do? I locked my computer out for a second. I didn't know I could do that. Uh, but anyway, that's just the extent of the areas that witchcraft is involved in. Any kind of ritualism. Any kind of, um, of uh, regarding of certain dates like October 31st, like Samhain. There are going to be human sacrifices made this evening in this country. And I know that not everybody uh, agrees with me, or, or maybe you might say, you know, Pastor, that's some pretty good stuff there, but, you know, we don't really get into all that. We just go out and get candy for the kids and everything like that. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to wait until Friday, November 1st. That's tomorrow. And Friday, November 1st, I'm going to go to Walmart, and they're going to have all of their candy half price. And I'm going to go to Walmart, and I'm not even going to say trick or treat. I'm just going to get as much candy as I can. I'm going to buy it for half off. And then I'm going to give it to all the kids here in the church. Um, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to say one more thing, and then I'm going to go. i got to lay down. Uh, Brother Wayne Shirk, you remember him. I spoke of him. Uh, every Halloween, uh, he is the man in our church that died of COVID. And I miss him dearly. But he and his wife, they did this every Halloween. Um, they lived in a subdivision, an I subdivision. And um, Wayne would, would always come by here. He would ask us to make however many copies of some DVDs I had done on Halloween and things like that. And he would give them out. Now, we would, we would make the DVDs free of charge to him. I figured if he's going to give them out, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to make him pay us. And so sometimes he would get 100, 150. But everybody that came to his door, and some would say, up. Oh, uh -uh, that's not allowed. He's, he's, breaking, uh, he's breaking the rules for this. You can't do that. Why not? He knows that children, because of where he lives, they're going to knock on his door anyway. So he always said, you know what? I'm going to give him some candy. And then I'm going to give him one of Pastor's DVDs. And you never know. Maybe they'll watch it. And God will sow a seed in their heart. And you just never know that maybe a young boy or a young lady 
that got one of those DVDs years ago might show up at our church one Sunday and say, you know, I got a DVD from this church from a guy that gave them out during Halloween. And I watched it. And boy, I'd like to hear more of that. You just never know. So even things like this can be seen as an opportunity to witness on behalf of Jesus Christ. So maybe you should do it. All right, well, the Zoom thing didn't go very well today. And, and I, I'm telling you, it was so raunchy what this guy put and I have a feeling I know who it is this person has hounded us over the years something terrible and so um, we pray for him his name is Chip you pray for Chip alright God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Uh, we thank God for you, for you being a blessing to us. I hope that in everything that I do, I can be a blessing to you as well. You pray for me that I get over all of this that I'm going through today. May the Lord bless you. And remember, next Tuesday, a day of prayer and fasting for our country as we count the votes. We'll see you.